Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about meiosis. We've been talking about mitosis, which is a form of asexual reproduction in eukaryotes where one cell is going to copy its DNA and split to give us two cells. This is a great form of reproduction for environments that are stable. They don't change a lot because these organisms are identical and well tolerant to that environment. But if the environment changes and kills one of these individuals, it's going to kill them all because they are identical to each other. So we see mitosis used a lot in unicellular eukaryotes for reproduction, but in multicellular eukaryotes, mitosis is more often used as a way to repair damage to the body and to grow, less often for reproduction. Multicellular eukaryotes are going to use meiosis as a way to create sex cells that can be combined to create variation in their offspring, um, but we'll get to that here in a minute. There are a lot of similarities between meiosis and mitosis and the processes. So I do wanna review these steps with you really quick. The first phase of any cell cycle is interphase. Our DNA is all spread out as chromatin. And um, during this phase, the DNA is gonna copy itself. Once it's copied, we can move into prophase. And in prophase, that DNA is gonna condense really tightly into these chromosomes and they are a one chromosome in its exact copy. So we have these sister chromatids that are attached together at the centromere. That, now that that DNA is uh, all tightly wound into these chromosomes, these sister chromatids, then the nucleus can dissolve. And these centrioles that have migrated to opposite poles are gonna produce spindle fibers. During metaphase, these sister chromatids are gonna align in the center of the cell and these spindle fibers are gonna attach at the centromere of the sister chromatids. And in anaphase, they're gonna pull these sister chromatids apart. They're gonna separate the copies so that now each cell is gonna have a single set of chromosomes. And in telophase, that, those chromosomes are gonna spread back out and each nucleus is gonna have the same number and types of chromosomes that was present in interphase. Uh, in telophase, that nuclear membrane is going to come back and those spindle fibers are going to dissolve and the cell is going to start pinching apart. And once it's pinched apart, we have cytokinesis and both of these cells will then re-enter interphase. Now this is for mitosis, but like I said, we are going to see a lot of similarities here with meiosis. Meiosis is used to create the cells involved in sexual reproduction, so the egg and the sperm. Um, and the egg and the sperm are each going to deliver the same amount of DNA to the offspring. So the egg is going to give one set and the sperm is going to give another set to the individual. And the offspring is going to be different from both parents because of this, because they're getting a set of genes that are going to be different from each other from each parent. And they're also going to be different from their siblings. Because those parents are going to be separating their chromosomes out, they're going to separate the copies they got from their mother and father into different eggs or sperm, um, they're going to donate different combinations to each of their children. So the offspring are going to show genes from both parents, and this is going to be better for a changing environment. These offspring being different, some of them are likely to have a combination of genes that allows them to survive better under changing circumstances. The downside to sexual reproduction is it's a lot slower than asexual reproduction because it does require finding a partner to exchange DNA with. Chromosomes are structures that contain the genes, the traits that are gonna be passed down to the future offspring. They are long pieces of DNA coding for many proteins. I think of chromosomes like suitcases. The bigger the suitcase, the more genes it will fit. The bigger the chromosome, the more of this type of gene it will fit. So um, human somatic cells, our body cells, contain 46 total chromosomes and two sets. So one set that we got from mom and one set that we got from dad. Each human gamete, egg or sperm, is going to donate 23 of those chromosomes or just one set to give us these 46 that we're going to find in all of our body cells. So we can see here a map of chromosomes. This is called a karyotype. And this is human chromosomes that have been painted using a technique called FISH, basically taking fluorescent little markers that are only gonna bind to certain places found on the DNA. And each different chromosome has some sequences that are unique to it. So they've been painted with a different color that's only gonna bind to those unique sequences. So we can see that we have some chromosomes that are long 
and they have the same color, the same types of um, sequences that these markers have found. And they get shorter as we go down and each is a different color. So we have pairs that match. They have the same genes, but maybe different forms of those genes. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one of these came from mom and one of these came from dad in each of these 23 pairs. Now, this is a human karyotype, so we have a total of 46 chromosomes, but that chromosome number can vary between species. Chimps, for example, have 48 chromosomes. Ploidy is a term used to describe the number of sets of chromosomes that an individual cell has. Gametes are your egg and sperm, and they are haploid cells, so they contain one full set of genes or chromosomes. That does not mean that they just have a single chromosome. They can have multiple chromosomes, but all of these contain different types of genes. They're all different from one another, so we have one set. Haploid cells can come together and merge DNA to give us diploid cells and these are cells with two full sets of chromosomes again that doesn't mean they just have two chromosomes but they have two chromosomes that match in terms of the types of genes that they carry so we have two red we have two purple we have two yellow representing the genes that would be on these chromosomes um, so diploid cells contain the full number of chromosomes in a normal body cell for that species now there are some species that can tolerate more than two sets of chromosomes. And mostly we're gonna find this in plants. They can be triploid or tetraploid, having three or four sets of chromosomes. Strawberries can even be octoploid, for example, and have eight sets of chromosomes. Fertilization is the process of joining the DNA into gametes together to make a zygote. So a gamete is a sex cell, it's an egg or a sperm cell, and each egg and sperm is gonna have one set of chromosomes. And that's half of the DNA we need in a somatic cell, a body cell. So once these gametes come together, then we have the full set of DNA that we need to have this zygote. And the zygote is the first cell formed after fertilization, it's a fertilized egg. And zygotes have two sets of DNA. We see here the sperm coming in contact with the egg, injecting its nucleus inside. And once this nucleus is inside, the egg and sperm nucleus are gonna merge. And here we're gonna have our zygote with two sets of DNA, one from the sperm, one from the egg. In humans, our egg and sperm, our gametes, are each gonna carry 23 chromosomes, and they're gonna come together to give us 46 chromosomes in the zygote. So 46 is our diploid number. It's the number of chromosomes we have in two sets of our genetic material. And 23 is our haploid number. That's the number of chromosomes we have in a single set of our genetic material. So chromosomes are arranged in 23 homologous pairs. 23 chromosomes you got from mom and 23 chromosomes you got from dad. And they're gonna match in size and in, no, in the types of genes that they carry. So one of these chromosomes you got from your mom and one you got from your dad, and we don't know which was which. But these chromosomes are gonna carry the same types of genes, but may have different forms of the gene. Uh, for example, mom could have given you brown hair here while dad gave you uh, blonde hair. Um, so they match in the types of genes, but different forms. These forms of a gene are called alleles. We talked about hair color on the last slide, so you could have black, brown, blonde, or red hair color. Those are your different forms or alleles for hair color. And you're gonna get one form of a gene from each parent for each gene, and those are arranged on homologous chromosomes. So these are your paired chromosomes that have genes that match, but they might have different forms. For example, we have uh, six chromosomes here in three homologous pairs. We'll say the red are from mom and the blue are from dad. So mom could have given us a gene for hair color that is blonde. Dad could have given one that is brown. Uh, those would be examples of different alleles. On a different chromosome, we might have a gene for eye color. And dad could have given you uh, brown eyes and so could mom. So that would be an example of two forms that would be the same. But in meiosis, these chromosomes, these homologs are gonna line up and be split apart, kind of like we saw with metaphase and anaphase and mitosis. So depending on how these chromosomes arrange themselves in terms of which side mom and dad's chromosomes are on, these um, egg and sperm 
are going to come out with different combinations of chromosomes and therefore different alleles, different forms of those genes split into different egg and sperm. So this is going to result in variation. And we're going to look at how this happens, well, right now. Meiosis is going to create our egg and sperm, our gametes used in sexual reproduction that come equipped with half the number of chromosomes needed for a zygote. And zygotes are going to have all of the DNA needed to make the body cells, the somatic cells of an individual. So the homologs are separated during meiosis, and this is going to result in variation. There are some similarities in the phases in mitosis and meiosis, but there are some differences. Meiosis has two divisions, meiosis one and meiosis two, and this is separated by a brief pause called interkinesis. Keep in mind that before any um, division in cells occurs, DNA is going to be replicated during interphase. So we start prophase with sister chromatids, a piece of DNA and its exact copy. Um, but in prophase one of meiosis, not only are the sister chromatids going to be together, our homologous chromosomes are going to be together. So we have sister chromatids from dad here, we have sister chromatids that may have been donated from mom here in red. Our nucleus is going to dissolve, our centrioles migrate to opposite poles and our spindle fibers form, just like we saw with prophase in mitosis. There is another key step that happens with meiosis in prophase one called crossing over. And we'll look at that here in just a minute, but that's gonna increase genetic variation even more in offspring. Um, at the end of prophase one, once the nucleus is dissolved, these homologs are going to line up in the center of the cell. The spindle fibers are going to attach to the centromeres of each sister pair. And in anaphase, they're going to pull these homologs apart. Notice that our sister chromatids are still attached at the centromere, but they've been pulled away from their matching copy. So dad's chromosome went this way and mom's went this way. And mom's original chromosomes went this way and dad's original chromosomes went this way. So we've split the sets of DNA in half. Um, at the end of anaphase, we're gonna go into telophase and this is gonna um, restore the nucleus temporarily and we're gonna get ready for the next round of meiosis. So this would be interkinesis, a brief pause. We're gonna have another round of prophase. The nucleus is gonna dissolve. Our centrioles are going to create new spindle fibers. They're gonna migrate again. Um, and now our sister chromatids are going to align in the center. But instead of having six sister chromatids like we should have in mitosis, we only have three. And this is happening in both cells created at the end of meiosis. So our sister chromatids have aligned in the center of these cells. And the spindle fibers are attached at the centromere. And they're going to start pulling these sisters apart during anaphase two. So that we end up with three chromosomes out of our original six that are gonna be in each cell. And during telophase and cytokinesis, these cells are gonna to split to give us four cells, each with half of the number of chromosomes that we originally had. And none of these cells are gonna be the same. So for instance, you can see that we have a long blue chromosome here with red tips and we have a, a solid long blue chromosome here. Here we don't have any solid long blue chromosomes. We have solid red, uh, solid red, and we have a red with blue tips where these exchange, exchanged pieces. So none of these four cells are going to be the same at the end of meiosis. Big things to know about meiosis one, these homologous chromosomes that match between mom and dad, they carry the same types of genes, but maybe different forms of the gene. They're going to match up. They're going to cross over little bits and pieces of DNA, and then they're going to be pulled apart. And this is going to increase variation in our offspring because it's going to offer new combinations of genes in individuals. So remember that during interphase, DNA copies itself. So we have one chromosome that makes an identical copy, and this is now called a sister chromatid. So we have a sister chromatid here from mom and a sister chromatid here from dad. And these are homologous pairs. They're going to carry the same types of genes, but maybe different forms. So let's say, for example, that um, we have eye color coded for here and hair color coded for here. Mom could have given us blue eyes and blonde hair. Dad could be donating brown eyes and brown hair. Well, these homologs are going to pair up during prophase one, and they're going to exchange little bits and pieces. So in the end, one of these sisters is going to be exactly like it was before, and the other one is going to be a little bit different. So now we have 
uh, one chromosome from mom that still has blue eyes and blonde hair, but the other chromosome is carrying the gene for blue eyes combined with the gene for brown hair. On dad's chromosome, we have the original copy. We have a gene coding for brown eyes and brown hair. But on the sister chromatid, we have a gene coding for brown eyes mixed with a gene coding for blonde hair. Um, so we exchange little bits and pieces. This way, when each one of these chromosomes is separated into four different gametes, none of them are going to be the same. And so our offspring is going to have new combination of genes to offer to the next generation. So meiosis one, we had crossing over and our homologs were separated, but we still have these sister chromatids held together and they need to be divided apart. And that's gonna be what happens in meiosis two. We're gonna start with these two cells made at the end of meiosis one. These sister chromatids are gonna align and they're gonna be pulled apart. And now we have four individual cells that are all different from one another. Crossing over and the separation of homologous chromosomes during meiosis is gonna allow these alleles, these forms of a gene to be separated randomly and independently from one another. And we call this independent assortment. It was um, developed by Gregor Mendel in the mid 1800s by looking at pea plants. So the idea here is that the alleles that a gamete gets for a particular gene have nothing to do with the alleles of other genes that that gamete gets. So for example, um, the hair color that is uh, coded for in this gamete will have nothing to do with the eye color, which will have nothing to do with whether or not this gamete um, contains a gene for freckles or being able to roll one's tongue. Um, and this is going to lead to genetic variation in our offspring because all of these genes are being separated individually. As we've learned, meiosis creates the eggs and sperm used in sexual reproduction. But this process is gonna be a little bit different in human males than it is in human females. So we start out with one cell in a male that's going to become sperm. We've got uh, homologous chromosomes. Those homologous chromosomes are gonna copy themselves and then they're gonna be split apart into four different functional sperm cells. With females, we're gonna start out with one um, original cell with homologous chromosomes that are gonna copy themselves. And these um, individual chromosomes are gonna be separated into four different egg cells. However, only one of these egg cells is going to be functional. Um, these cells divide asymmetrically. And so we end up with three little teeny tiny cells that we call polar bodies and they are not used in reproduction. Instead, they go back into nourishing this uh, larger egg cell that will be used um, for reproduction. The main goal of sexual reproduction is variation in offspring, and there are three sources of variation. Crossing over of genetic information between mom and dad's homologous chromosomes, the independent assortment of those homologous chromosomes into different uh, gametes during meiosis, and the union of egg and sperm from different individuals carrying unique sets of traits during fertilization. Those are your three sources of uh, variation. And variation is important because it allows species to have a better chance of surviving changing conditions. There might be one uh, organism in a population that has a genetic combination that will allow it to survive a changing environment better. And then it can pass on those traits when it reproduces and we should see those traits more often in that um, population. So each human gamete, again, contains 23 chromosomes, one set of DNA, and there are over 20,000 genes contained in those 23 chromosomes. Those 23 chromosomes are gonna be combined during fertilization to give us 46 chromosomes in our zygote. And here we see another karyotype, a map of our chromosomes, can see that you have your pairs um, and there are 23 of them arranged by size. This last pair will tell us if we have a male or a female. So two X chromosomes, those are long chromosomes, would be a female and an X and a Y chromosome would be a male. Ys are a little bit shorter than X. You will never have a YY 
um, because you do have to have a certain amount of protein carried on at least one of these X chromosomes. No two people on earth are genetically identical except for identical twins like Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen here. Identical twins form when an egg is fertilized by a sperm and that zygote is gonna split to become two zygotes that are genetically the same. They are identical, they're clones of one another. And each one of those zygotes is gonna then go through mitosis making the body cells for an individual, but those individuals are gonna have the exact same type of DNA. All humans share 99.9% .9 of their DNA. That's your DNA compared to a complete stranger's is 99.9% .9 the same. It's this one-tenth of a percent that makes us different. And this one-tenth of a percent that can be tested to determine identity and family lineage. So for paternity tests, for example, or for crime scene investigations to determine if a person's DNA was left at the scene of a crime. Uh, so diversity exists from all sexually reproducing organisms. And again, this comes from independent assortment of those homologous chromosomes, the crossing over of those homologous chromosomes, and then the different combinations of egg and sperm coming together. In mitosis and meiosis, we're gonna start with one parent cell. And this parent cell has two chromosomes and they have matching genes, so they are homologs. Um, in interphase, those chromosomes are gonna copy themselves and we're gonna have sister chromatids attached at the centromere. But during mitosis, we're gonna just line up those sister chromatids and split them apart so that each of our daughter cells is exactly the same to those parent cells that we started with. However, with meiosis, we're going to align those homologs and separate them. And then we're gonna align those sisters and separate them. So we end up with four cells. And remember, due to crossing over, each one of these gametes here is going to be different from one another. I've created a few charts here to help you quickly compare your types of reproduction and your cell cycles. So with sexual reproduction, we have two parents that uh, combine DNA. With asexual, we are reproducing cells using the DNA from one parent. Um, sexual reproduction produces egg and sperm through the process of meiosis, and asexual reproduction produces body cells through mitosis. They're cloning our cells here. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both types of reproduction. The advantages to sexual reproduction is that the population is genetically diverse. The individuals are different from one another. So some organisms are more likely to survive environmental hazards and they will be able to pass on those traits that allow them to survive those environmental hazards so that those traits tend to build up in populations over time. The disadvantages to sexual reproduction is that we get fewer offspring because this process is slow. It requires finding a partner, which can often take time. Asexual reproduction uh, produces a lot of offspring very quickly. And that's one of the advantages to asexual reproduction. They can colonize an area and just take over it. But the disadvantages to asexual reproduction is that all of these massive amount of individuals are genetically identical to one another. So they're all susceptible to the same environmental hazards. And if the environment changes to kill one of those individuals, it will kill them all because they're all exactly the same. When we compare our cell cycles, mitosis is gonna have a one cell division and that one cell is gonna to divide to give us two cells. With meiosis, we're gonna have a one cell that divides twice and our one cell is gonna give us two cells and then our two cells are gonna divide again to give us four cells. Mitosis produces cells that are genetically identical to one another, they are clones of each other. And meiosis is gonna produce cells that are genetically varied. Remember that meiosis produces gametes, these egg and sperm, and each egg and sperm is only gonna contain half the DNA that it takes to make an entire um, diploid organism. And mitosis is gonna produce our somatic cells or our body cells um, through just uh, cloning cells um, in an area. Here are my resources and I hope you've learned a little bit more about how eggs and sperm are made and how those eggs and sperm contribute to differences in an entire population.